Okay, so we're um, we're gonna actually open from with prayer from back here first. Um, the part of the opening of prayer is we're gonna pray for Ben. Ben is trying to get through some stuff and move forward and and we need to pray for him. So uh, we're gonna start with that. We're gonna end with that. Actually, we're gonna go start and begin with that. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for our brother Ben. We thank you for his life dedicated to you, that he has surrendered to you, that he belongs to you, that he is your son. Lord, in the midst of that, he is trying to be obedient. But he needs your hands, he needs your grace, and he needs your power in healing him. More specifically, praising you for what you're doing right now, despite the fact that it is not easy. So, Lord, would you just be with them in an incredible way during this time when you feel supported and loved every minute? And may, Lord, would you help them to, to get comfort from this topic of divine healing that we have talked about tonight? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so I've got, can you guys see the, the passages up on the board? Kind of. All right, let's, let's go ahead and sign those as I get started. Cheryl, would you take the top one? And maybe Sam or Julia, would you take Psalms 133? And then, um, Laura Lee, would you take Isaiah 53 4? And John, would you take Matthew 8? And Dane, would you take Mark 16? Eden, would you take 1 Peter? And Doug, would you take James 5? Now we can get to those. All right, so as I go into this, we're going to be talking about divine healing. We have a doctrine about divine healing. But well, before I get started, I want to just give it a little bit of background. Last week we talked about um, last week we talked about baptism of the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts. Instead of lumping it more together. I did the opposite. I tried to give context for specific kinds of gifts and different ways that God works. In the same way, when we're talking about subjects like healing, it can be tempting to just go to the Bible, find anything that says the word healing, and lump it all together as the same topic, or that God does it the same way every time, or that we're always talking about the same circumstance. And that isn't true. Different healing passages have different contexts. Different healing passages have different circumstances. And so lumping it all together blindly is not the right move. Um, so as we go, we're going to get to that. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read the statement. This I'm going to start with reading the statement. I'm going to go with, we're going to read the passages that go with our statement. And then from that, I'm going to try to get a lot more specific about how healing works, what it is and is not supposed to be, and what we believe as a church about this topic. So here's our statement. In accordance with the teaching of scriptures, we trust our Heavenly Father to protect and heal our bodies from sickness and disease. We believe that divine healing for the body, as with all redemptive blessings of God, has been provided for us by the atoning death and victorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the privilege of all believers and is appropriated by faith in our Heavenly Father's unfailing promises. And then it gives passages. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the passages that are attached to this statement and see what those look like. So let's look at the first one. Okay, Exodus 15, 26. And he said, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. Okay. So, that's a passage about healing. What is the context, though, of that passage? Obedience. Well, obedience to what? The law. Which part of the law? <laughs> statutes. The statutes from Exodus. So this is the part of the law that was given to the Israelites as they were leaving Egypt. 
This is in conjunction with the Ten Commandments. It starts with the Ten Commandments and goes on to a whole bunch more. Yeah, but they weren't given until after that event. The first commandment was given in Exodus 20. Ten commandments given in Exodus okay. 20. Okay, so let's look at it. Exodus 15. It's when they were at Mara. Yeah. And the waters were bitter. The bitter waters. Yep. Oh, there's, there's, there's the blessings and then the curses, so this passage is in the curses in. Right. It's included in there. Yeah. <clears throat> Ultimately, we're looking, we are looking at a very specific situation. God had just smote the Egyptians with curses, specific diseases. They had just witnessed curses against Egypt. And this is a promise that if they keep these statutes and regulations, that God will not do to them as God did to the Egyptians. Okay? I would not say that that's a promise for the church. I wouldn't. This is a promise to the Israelites in this situation. Um, he's trying to, to console them. Don't be frightened. I'm going to do to you to the Egyptians. I won't. But there's a stipulation if you keep my commandments. Later, he's going to give a bunch of other promises like favor in battle and rain on your crops and uh, your children won't be stillborn and you're going to have lots of babies and there's going to be lots of promises that go with keeping the commandments. Uh, if we're going to say that, that God's commandments to the Israelites regarding health, we can claim those, then we have to take all of it. Yes. We, have to, we have to go, then we're going to keep all the law, and we're going to expect to get all the promises and benefits that God promised to go with that law. If we're not going to do that, then it isn't our job to take the promises God gave Israel and, and apply it blanketly to the church. We can't pick the ones we like and leave out the rest. It's not, it's not, that is not the appropriate context for that. I'm not trying to say that God doesn't heal. I'm saying that that isn't the appropriate use of that verse. Yeah. So when I talk about we can't take all of healing and lump it together in one category, that's what I'm trying to say. Not all healing and all promises of healing come in the same context. Well, let's look at Psalm 103. Psalm 103 verse 3? Yeah. I'll give it to 2. Bless the Lord on my soul and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Excellent. Okay. This is more generalized. Um, how does this contrast with the book of Job? What did God do to Job? Allowed him to fall foul of sickness. Uh, allowed him to have a terrible disease for quite some time. He eventually cured him of it also. But he allowed Job to get a disease. And he was righteous. We need to be careful when we read these psalms of praise and these other psalms that we don't take things and we, we take this and we'll look, but we don't look at this right next to it. You've got to be careful. Look, if anyone has ever healed of a disease, God did it. If I have got a cold and it doesn't kill me, it's because God was gracious and allowed my body to heal. He created my body to do that. Then God gives the credit that I got a cold and it didn't kill me. It doesn't say we never get diseases, and it says that God won't cure them. And we're going to talk some more in James about some curing of diseases. How about Isaiah 53, 1 through 5? That's our next one. Yeah, if you could do one through five, that would be more better. More better. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. It is despised, or he is despised, and rejected by him. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. 
He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Can I listen to you? Oh, hi. Yeah. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was buried for our sins. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Okay, so this is a classic passage that is often used to identify that because Jesus suffered on the cross, I should be able to be healed. Um, as it turns out, have you ever heard the term the, the prophets should be judged by the prophets? That means that, that we use the Bible to interpret the Bible. It's the very, very best way to interpret the Bible. It turns out the Bible interprets this verse for us. Um, who has the uh, first Peter verse? Let's hear that. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live to righteousness. And he is really good and true. Okay. Did everyone hear that or was it too quiet? Yeah. I didn't okay. say it really loud. That was first Peter five. No, 1 Peter 2.24. Sorry, 2.24. Man, this is small. <laughs> Woo! All right, I'm going to read it louder. He himself... I uh, should just look at it with my own Bible. This is so small. Bore our sins in his body on the tree. That's on the cross. So we might die to sins and live for righteousness. That's the statement. Then it quotes the Old Testament to explain what he just said. By his wounds you have been healed. You see what's happening? It says what we're healed of. It says our relationship with God has been healed. The topic in 1 Peter is not physical healing. The topic in 1 Peter isn't our health. It isn't sickness, it's not injury, it's not any of that. It is the topic in 1 Peter is our relationship with God. So it's talking about this topic of relationship with God, and then it quotes this exact passage, and it says, here's the proof. By his wounds we are healed. What is healed? Our relationship with God. Our break with God caused by our transgressions. I am made righteous, and that's the healing we're talking about in this case. So in Isaiah 53, 4, this is a spiritual healing. We're going to talk about that later in the types of healing. When we say divine healing, there's more than one kind. There's physical healing, there's emotional healing, but there's spiritual healing. Spiritual healing has got to be the most important part. That, that's, that's the most essential, critical healing we can experience. And this passage is talking about spiritual healing. That's what we learned in Peter. Because that's the topic of Peter. So what's the next one? Matthew 8, 16 and 17. Who's got that? I. Okay. When the, when the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits uh, with his word, and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by, the, by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Excellent. So, again, according to the Bible, when Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of Isaiah, he did that by healing the sick as part of his ministry here on earth. Hallelujah. I agree. What am I going to do? Disagree with the Bible? No. Absolutely not. The Bible makes it clear that when Jesus did healing on this earth, it fulfilled the promises of Isaiah. Awesome. How about Mark 16, 17, and 18? And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will take up serpents, and they will drink anything, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Excellent. So one of the kinds of healings that happens in the New Testament church is as a sign. 
Jesus promised that this would be a sign that would be used. Excellent. We're going to talk about that in, in later on as well. So it is appropriate that there is healing that God uses as a sign. Because that's exactly what Jesus said would happen. And then our last one that was in our doctrinal statement is James 5, 14 and 15. That's the last one. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer often in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be healed. Okay. So this is bringing your illness to the elders for prayer. And there's a specific context for this as well. So now we've got a couple different kinds of things that we've seen in the New Testament. We've seen Jesus doing miracles. And we're going we're gonna to talk in a second later that we had others that did this. You know, Peter and John and Paul all did miracles in which people were miraculously healed. And those were a sign and Jesus promised that that would happen. Of course, last week we talked about the gift of healing as one of the manifestation gifts. We're going to talk about that in a second. And now we have healing that involves the elders. And then you would come to the elders when you were ill, and then there would be a process by which they could pray for you. So we're going to talk about that too. But all of these different situations have their own context. They are not the same. They're, they're not, there's not a rubber stamp of this is how healing works. There are different circumstances. There are different promises. They relate to different people. And that's what we're going to spend some time talking about. Okay? We're going to do that. I love my board. I love my board because I can flip it and it's awesome. Okay, so we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about healing. What kind of healing do we have? <coughs> what is the purpose of divine healing? Why? Why does God divinely heal us? And then, what methods are there that divine healing takes place? Okay? Those are the topics we're going to look over and try to unravel this and see if we can have a better understanding more than just God heals. Okay? Well, how, how do we activate that? How do we be a part of that? How, do, how does that happen in the church? other than we just have a doctrine that God healed. So let's try to be more specific. Okay? So, let's start with kinds of healing. What is it? Well, some of them we've already come up with, right? So what did, what, in our passage in James, what kind of healing was that for? Do you remember? It was physical healing. Yep, and specifically, what kind of physical? Sickness. 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 Illness. Illness. Okay. Are there other kinds of physical healing? Yes, there are. We're going to get that in a second. But illness is one type of physical healing. Okay. Um, how about... Uh, Anyone want to go to Acts chapter 3, verse 2 as an example? There's tons of them, but it would be, it's a good one. Go ahead. And a certain man, lame from the mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Jesus, to ask alms from those who are in the Okay, and then Peter heals him. This is way, so what kind of injury, what kind of physical healing is this? Lame from when? We're actually talking about a birth defect here. This isn't something that happened to you along the way. This is something they were born with. They were born broken, and God heals them of this thing they were even born with. That's a lot different than an illness. That's a totally different category of healing. He's physically lame, had been that way since the time he was born. That's, that's pretty dramatic. Um, how about Philippians 4.19? Which one? Philippians 4.19. I 
I got it. Yep, go ahead. But my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I'm going to get a little bit broad here. Sometimes we have needs that we need healed in that aren't just because I'm injured or I'm sick. We can be healed of, of desperate needs in our life. Yes. God can supply for our needs. And he promises that he can. He can heal of abject poverty. He can heal of addiction. He can heal of all kinds of different things that we need healing in. That aren't just an injury by themselves. Uh, we already talked about James 5.16, didn't we? And that was... Oh, uh, no, we didn't. Yeah, we did. Yeah, James 5.16 was physical illness. Yeah. Sickness. Yeah, so we already talked about that. Um, how about 1 Peter 2.24? We did talk about that. By, our stri by his stripes we were healed. And what kind of healing did we call that? Spiritual. Spiritual. <laughs> okay. How about John fourteen twenty seven? John fourteen twenty seven. I'll read it. Peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. What kind of healing is that? It's healing is it's emotional healing. It's healing is it's being set free from fear. I'm going to go to another one, Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Divine healing means restoring us to the condition he wants us to be in. Divine healing means bringing us as a person, as a human, into the right alignment with him so that we can be effective, functional, and work, work in the kingdom. So I need to be physically well to do that. I need to be emotionally well to do that. I need to be spiritually well to do that. I need to be a whole person who's functional so that I can work in the kingdom and accomplish what it is, whatever it is God has said before me to do. It's a comprehensive thing. It's a whole person thing, not just a physical thing. I, I want to say this because we can get trapped in a narrow perspective of what it is we think healing can be about and what God's capable of doing. Does that make sense? So if God can heal us of all kinds of things. All of those things have in common as your own. All the fruit of the effect of sin in you as well. Absolutely. And God overarches that, so. Perfect point. 
absolutely excellent. All of this is the result of the fall. All of the problems here came from our sin. And the sin in the world, sin in our lives, the, the effects of the curse on our bodies, these are the things that came as a result. And God can undo the curse. Yes. <coughs> he can't. And, and we need to get our head around that there's no part of the curse too difficult for him to undo. Amen. I mean, if he got rid of my separation from him, that I can be his heir, that he can forgive me of sin, that we can be eternally reconciled and go to heaven, well, that's the hardest part. If he can do that, he can do any of the rest of it. All the rest of it's easy compared to that part. That's the hard part. So God wants to heal us and can heal us of all kinds of things. So the next question is, why? Is this important? Is it important to understand why God heals? I think it is. And I will tell you why it's important. Because it is very easy when we start talking about this topic of healing for it to become quite selfish. I want to be healed because I want to feel better because this is what I want and would make me happy. Newsflash, that isn't why God heals you. God heals you for his glory. Yes. God heals you for his glory, not your comfort. This is not because he, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'll make it better. It's for his glory, it's for his purposes. Keep in mind that God can give you trials for his glory also. So when we start to think, God, you owe it to me to make my life easier, better, nicer, more healthy, we've got it really wrapped around the wrong direction. That's not how it works. So it is important that we understand why God heals. We already read from Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. What was the purpose in that, if you remember, in the end of Mark? As a sign. As a sign. Who are signs normally for? Unbelievers. Normally for unbelievers. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a personal example from our lives of a, of a thing that I think was a sign and not for an unbeliever. Uh, when we lived here many yonks ago, where's, where's Mason? There aren't many yonks. Not many yonks, there's yonks. one yonks. 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 Okay. Yonks. Yonks ago. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Mason. You okay. Yonks ago when we lived here. My wife and I were struggling with with some of the greater things that God is capable of doing. We come from a very conservative background on the side. And so in the midst of our struggles. Cheryl burned her hand. Now, when I say she burned her hand, she was cooking, and I'm going to make it shorter than she told me, but you know what boiling oil looks like, right? Okay, when boiling oil splashes on your hand, it is not a minor burn. It, it, it does, that's not in the minor category ever. Boiling oil, oil is a, is a, bowl, bowl, no, no man. Okay, sorry. That's that's Southern. That's America. Georgia time. Georgia time. Bowl bowl no. Okay, that was that was American Southern for boiling oil. <laughs> when boiling oil hits on your hands, it is a serious burn. Cheryl goes over to another person's house. Who the person is isn't important because I'm not trying to glorify them. They pray for my wife's hand, and the burn goes away. I mean, it goes away. Okay. Did that need to happen for my wife to be effective as a Christian? Probably not. She probably would have healed and gotten over it. I, I don't think that that 
manifestation of God's power was essential physically for my wife to get on with being a mom or being a wife or doing stuff in the church. What did God do in that moment? Woke my wife up to, well, God can do this after all. Strengthened her faith and her belief. It strengthened her. It was a sign to her to go, ho, oh, 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 God did that. God just did that. So it can be a sign to unbelievers, but it can also be a sign for our faith, for the strengthening of our faith. God provides signs from time to time, specifically for the strengthening of our faith. He does that. You don't get to pick when he does that. I'm going to get to that in a second. Under what method? We're going to get to that in a second. Okay? So that's one of the reasons that God heals. is for a sign, either for unbelievers or to believers, to strengthen our faith. Um... Last week we went over this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 7, and then I'm going to skip to verse 9. If you were here last week, you're going to recognize this passage. I'm talking about spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read the two. You tell me what the reason for this healing is. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and so on. So what is the purpose that's listed there? The common good. God can heal for the common good. God can heal simply because he wants to bless you and it's for the common good of the congregation and he does it. That is one of the purposes behind God healing. That's what it said right there. Is the purpose of these gifts was for the common good. And then it was healing. Of course, it also means that the other gifts listed there are also for the common good. That the reason for these gifts is for the common good. It is to edify all of us. It's something that God can do through us for us for each other. It is awesome. And the more we see God work through us to each other, the tighter this community is going to get. We're going to reach a whole different kind of codependence and I don't, that's a bad word, codependence, okay. Um, godly dependence, I don't know, whatever the right word is, we're going to reach a whole new level of interacting with each other. The more and more we find Josh meeting my needs because God's working through Josh. Or me meeting Sam. Or Cheryl with Julia. And so forth and so on. So that's the reason. Um, but let's, let's talk about Linux. I'd say these are the two main reasons as a sign for the common good. As a counterexample, I would like to propose to you, I believe that Paul, the Apostle Paul, had poor eyesight. There's a couple reasons I believe that. Uh, one of them is because uh, in Galatians 6, 11, he writes, he wrote large letters that I had to write in to finish this off. Somebody else wrote, and now that I'm writing this last part, I had to write it big. I had to write a big, I think it's because he couldn't see very well. Kind of back that up, I don't know if you knew this, but the first place that Paul went to on his missionary journeys was an island called Cyprus. Cyprus was well known for a highly communicable eye disease that was prevalent on the island. But we don't have any proof that Paul went to that, we don't have proof of that. But we know that Paul went to that island first, and we know that Galatians was the first book that I believe Galatians was the first book he wrote. And by the time he wrote Galatians, he was already having problems with his eyes. Now, Paul raised someone from the dead, or more accurately, God raised someone through the, to the, from the dead through Paul. But he couldn't fix his own eyes? See, there are times when 
for our good, he allows us to continue to suffer something. It is not appropriate to say, well, God, for the common good, I want you to feel everything that I have wrong with me, and I would like you to do it right now, please. That is an incorrect attitude to what God can and cannot do. Uh, I do not believe that that's godly, and I don't believe it's biblical. Um, and I think that Paul's example of asking three times for a thorn in the flesh to be removed, I believe, I don't have proof, but I believe that it concerns his eyesight. And I think God said, no. I'm good. You're good. You manage. Trust in me. Trust in me. You'll be okay. At least to my third category. What method? How does it happen? These are things God can heal us from. And this is why. Let's just add this one. Can we just add? Paul also says this interesting with Timothy as well. In um, 1 Timothy um, 5.23, uh, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach, stomach and frequent illnesses. So he says to Timothy, he doesn't say thank the heal. Yeah. He says try a bit of that. Try, try, try some medication. Try some medication. True, fact. So the question is why didn't he just go snap your heel? Well, we're gonna, actually, that is a great segue into this. Because how God heals is specific, especially in the New Testament. Um, I'm going to look at three different ways that God heals. Okay? Three ways. The first one has to do with the passage we already looked at, 1 Peter 2.24, when we talked about that by his stripes we are healed had to do with our relationship with God. So, if Christ's suffering on the cross and my acceptance of that healed my relationship with God, then what's the cause of that healing? There's things that Christ provides. Finished works. There are things that, that come as a result of my position with God, and there's also things that come as a result of my maturity in Christ. There are healings that happen in my life, especially when we're talking about spiritual, emotional, mental healing things, that come as a result of being obedient, of changing. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, Philippians 4.6. I don't know about you, but I have needed healing from anxiety from time to time. Have you ever needed to be healed with anxiety? Okay, here's the prescription for healing from anxiety. You want to know how God says to do it? It's right here in Philippians 4, 6. Here's what it says. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And then the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on and says, Finally, brother, whatever is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute, excellent, worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Do you want to be healed from anxiety? There's your prescription. Christ will provide it in our obedience. He's told us what we need to do to be cured of anxiety. We need to do it. We need to be obedient in that. In this particular case, there's no other intermittent here. God will provide. God can heal us direct. In our relationship with God, our confidence should change. God heals us of bad attitudes. God, the Holy Spirit works in us to heal all kinds of ick. Directly in me, as I'm able to read the word and to pray and to mature and to grow, the Holy Spirit heals me, just him and me. He heals me. So 
So that's one method. Christ, the Holy Spirit, works in my life to heal what is broken. In many cases, the most important things in the world. The second way is we read in, Je in James something really interesting. We were in James 5, if you remember, 14 through 16. But we need to pull that apart a little bit more. This is about the elders, going to the elders. Well, let's look at that. James 5, 14 through 16. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. Now think about this part, the sins. Therefore, confess your sins one to another. And pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can avail much. You know, as Protestants, that means people who aren't Catholic, we, um, we've decided we don't need to confess our sins to each other. We've decided that it's purely a private matter when I sin. I don't have to tell anybody thank you very much. A little bit. We've taken it way too far. The Catholics have gone to the point of you must confess it to the Father or you can't be forgiven. Way too far. Sin is my problem, might have known, no one else needs to know about it ever. Way too far. In the middle. There is a time to come to the elders and confess your sin. Because it's overwhelming. We have ailments, anxiety, guilt, heartburn, ulcers, terror, problems that we have brought on ourselves from our sin. And we need to get it off of our chest. We need to talk it out. We need to admit it to somebody. We need to tell someone. And in telling them, they can pray for us. And they can walk alongside us. And we can get assistance, and we can get help, and we can get prayer, and we can get someone who loves us, and we can move forward. Because some of our, of our physical problems is due to the internal turmoil of our own sin, our own mistakes. We are capable of damaging ourselves with our sin. Is that the way God would say, um, we can confess our sin in his face, but he doesn't forgive us from our sin? Absolutely. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, we learn, I'm not going to go there, in 1 Corinthians 11, 28 through 30, it says, your sin can kill you. You can sin till you die. The context of this passage in James and being held from the seal of illness is this. I'm the one who's sick. I know I've got a problem. I go to the elders, and part of this is a confession of where I'm at, and I'm being open and honest about where I'm at, and they're praying with me, and in the midst of it, I am healed of the illness, of the, of the yuck, of the mess I am in. It's initiated by the person who's sick, and they come to the elders not just for physical, but for spiritual healing. This, is, this, is a, this can be both. Because the one can cause the other. So the method here is the elders and the cause or the, the person initiating is the person that's, that's sick. The sick person initiates this. I am not well, and I'm coming to the elders to ask for help. Okay? The last method, though, goes in a different direction. It has to do with the, with the person with the gift of healing. We talked about this last week. We talked about the manifestation gifts. 
Okay, and healing is one of the manifestation gifts. So let me tell you how all of uh, I can take you to a specific scripture, but you're going to go, trust me, I think you're going to be able to follow me. When we go to any miracle in the Bible, this is how it goes. There's a need. God gives an instruction to his servant. The servant obeys the instruction. God meets the need. God gets the glory. We can see it in the Red Sea, right? This is the children of Israel trapped between Egypt and an ocean. We got a problem. There's a need. God says to Moses, hold the stick over the water. That's a pretty silly thing to do when there's an army behind you in an ocean, but okay, fine. You want me to hold the stick out over the water? I'll hold the stick. <clears throat> ocean parts. People go across. God gets the glory. This is, this is the model of all miracles in the whole Bible. It doesn't change when we get to Peter and Paul and John and Jesus even. Every single one of them is the same story. There was a need. God spoke to the servant and said, you do this. And they do it. And in their obedience, then the miracle happens. And then God gets the glory. What am I trying to say by this? That when we're talking about the gifts, the manifestation gifts, whether we're talking about healing or prophecy or tongues or uh, miracles or whatever the thing is, the form goes like this. There's a need. God speaks to the person with the gift. That person acts in obedience. In their act of obedience, God works and does his thing. Then God gets the glory. So this method is the, with the gift. It's from God. He initiates. Can I ask a question? Yeah. The there is one case that that doesn't apply. It says that the woman with the issue of blood. Because it's, Jesus said that it's your faith that has made you whole. True. He, he, there was no command or there was no... Um, there was nothing... There was no... Well, I mean, Christ was the healer, yeah. but he wasn't given a, a direction. She just appropriated yeah. the healing. Yep, that's a weird example. Um, In this model, I would put that up here. She had a need. She was obedient to what God was saying in her life to do. She acted in faith yeah. to reach out. And God responded to her faith by meeting her need as she did directly. I would say that, that in this model, that it would fall in this category for someone. She didn't go to elders. She, did, she, she felt compelled to take an action. She took that action. In that action, God reacted and healed her. Do I think that's possible today? Absolutely. Uh, let me just tell you, um, through all of this, don't take away from this that we should quit praying for people to get healed because they don't fit in a specific category. Don't do that. Please don't do that. God gets the glory. God gets the glory. I'm trying to outline some categories that we can see and apply easily, but not everything that God does fits in my neat little boxes. And he doesn't have to. I, I, I don't have the right to, to say, God, I made this little bottle. Look how neat it is. It's a chart. It's nice. And God's not obligated to somehow meet those because I made the little chart. I get that. That's not the purpose of the chart. The purpose is to help us categorize ways in which we should be thinking about how healing works in our community. But absolutely. As an individual, whatever it is, maybe I have cancer. Maybe God, God reveals to me, Keith, I want you to have faith in me that I'm going to cure you of this cancer. There's no one else involved. That's just what God tells me in my spirit, in my prayer. And then I go, okay, God, I'm going to have faith in you. I'm going to, this is between you and me, and I'm going to trust that you're going to get it. And then he heals me of cancer. He's allowed to do that. That's, that's this here. He's provided. I had a desperate need. I was going to die. He provided for me direct. Hallelujah. He's allowed to do that. 
that's the way mostly that um, spiritual restoration happens as well. Mm. Yeah. Like there's not often a third person in there. Yeah. There can be a third person, but there can be. But it doesn't have to be. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So really what I'm trying to get to with this is, is thinking about God wants to heal us of all different kinds of things. Okay? He may do it as a sign. He may do it simply for the common good because he loves us. He always does it to glorify himself. It's never for our glory. And then when we're thinking about methods, we should be thinking sometimes it's, sometimes this is a between me and God thing. And that's how the healing, whatever kind of healing it is, that's how it's going to work. Sometimes we need to go and confess. Sometimes there's a problem in our life that we need to get rid of. Sometimes we've got a mess, and until we go get help, we are never going to get any resolution. And we need to humble ourselves. We need to get rid of my pride and go talk to people that can help me and ask for help. And that's a spiritual authority issue. That's why you're going to the elders. Because you're staying in your spiritual authority. You're staying in what God has provided for your, for your church family. And you're going to people that you should be able to trust spiritually. And you're talking with them about your issues so that they can be obedient to God and find a solution. And other times, there'll be a person that God has gifted with healings. That's going to be motivated by what's not telling them. And they are going to act in obedience. And healing is going to take place. Because that's the gift and the role and, and the, the path that he has for them in their obedience to God in the body. Does that make sense? I, and why did I go into all this detail? Because that's a lot different than simply saying we think that uh, God heals us and it's through what Christ did and we can just expect to be healed. It's a little bit too simplistic for me. I, I, to me, think that this topic deserves a little more granularity, a little more specificness in how it works for that. And that's why I went into the detail. Um, is there questions on that? Kind of? Not really? Okay. Does God heal miraculously? I, I think he does. Does he do it every time? I've got a sister in a wheelchair. If I thought he'd healed every time, she'd be walking. She's not. And you know what? She glorifies God in that wheelchair so beautifully. I cannot explain to you what a witness to God she is in that wheelchair. God is glorified by the fact that she lives her life the way he has designed her to live her life. She is a glory to God exactly the way she is. He gets to decide that. He gets to decide that. And it's okay. But I don't want us as a church to be surprised when God does really cool stuff. Quite the opposite. I want us to get more and more comfortable with the idea that God can do things we can't explain. And that's just awesome. Okay. To be excited about God doing things we couldn't possibly explain. Now, so. No, we can't even explain salvation, right? No, I'm just saying, you know, we also can't explain salvation. It's a miracle. So. It's absolutely perfect. Um, okay. Yes. We can do it. And, and just as a praise report, and John, I'm not going to name names. In the last four months, five months, we've had. A lot of people make decisions for Christ. At least four in the last four months. For a community our size, that is mind-blowing. So I'm not saying that so we can count numbers. Sam warns me about that all the time. I'm saying that so we can say, hey, God is moving and working for us. God's doing something here. God is changing our mission focus. And we need to be ready because if God wants to continue bringing unbelievers to himself, 
We might need to start anticipating what signs he's going to use to bring up believers to himself. It could be a little bit past our comfort level. He's allowed to do that. Comfort level was never never a thing with God anyway. Yeah. Obedience was. Obedience is. When someone comes to you who's, who needs prayer, then it's your job to give it to them. That's right. And and, and leave the results up to God. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, so, can you just write that up here? That is the method. Different directions, right? Obedience to God directly. Obedience to go to the elders. Obedience to hear what God asks us to do and to pray for someone in faith even though that's scary. It's obedience no matter how you slice it. That's how this is going to go. It's going to go through obedience. Obedience is what's going to unlock this. Yeah. If you go to the shop or something and you're pushing a trolley and them this and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit's quitting the Spirit and he says, I want you to pray for that person. Well, you better go. 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 Absolutely. And you've got to be that contagious person that's already talking about all of them. That's right. You have to forget yourself and you can have this, you know, so that the Lord's driving and the Lord's driving and the Lord's driving and the Lord's that if you're an evangelist that you're stepping out and you're sharing Christ, and maybe it's more of a healing thing and you pray for something in their life and suddenly it gets healed and they're like, whoa, what just happened? Maybe God's real. Who knows what it is God's asking you to do, but he's going to do it according to how he's gifted you to operate. Yeah. And so, but we've got to learn to start taking risks that when we hear that still small voice, we don't go, oh, that's stupid. But well, that's embarrassing. No, no, I don't have time for that. Look, I've got to be somewhere in 15 minutes, and if I did that, I'd be like, we've got to shut that down. So I start recognizing that when God asks me to do something, it's time to do what he asks me to do. Yeah? Sometimes when you're with me, my sister's back in the night, we live on the street and we need to go and see some people on the and then where we go or whatever, and, and, and the Holy Spirit will quicken us. You know, to go and pray for the person because um, you don't know what's going on in their life, and, and then no. all of a sudden you're, you're praying for them, you know, and by your faith they, you, they've been healed by you, you know, and that they feel better. And when you see them a week later, they, they um, uh, feel a bit better, you know, because I'm doing crazy. All glory to the Lord, we say, we don't say that. Um, Yes. My sister was at a train station. Yeah. People will talk to her because she's in a wheelchair, so they feel sorry for her. So they'll talk to her before they would shut off anybody else. She was in the wheel in the train station guy said, Go talk to that guy over there sitting on the bench looking lonely. He had this crazy story. He became a Christian there on the bench. Right this is probably ten years ago. The point of the story is whoever you are. When God speaks to you to move, move. Move. All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we stand here acknowledging to you as a church that you can heal, that, that you love to heal, actually. That it is within your provision for the common good that people will be healed. That we shouldn't somehow have some opinion that this is a one-off thing or it would never happen or that you don't, you know, God doesn't do that anymore. God, you heal. But Lord, would you take our blinders off to the kind of ways that you heal, maybe even to the most important ways that you heal. That, that most, most, most importantly, that you need to heal people spiritually. You need to heal their relationship with you so that they can know you so that they can be your sons and daughters so they can be adopted by you so they can be part of your kingdom we, even outside that we have mental problems we have emotional problems we have relationship problems we have confidence problems we have anxiety problems 
And Lord, we need healing from all those things. And in addition to that, Lord, we have physical needs. Lord, would you make the foundation of our Christian life that our relationship with you is such that we're growing, that we're being obedient, that we're reaching maturity so that you are constantly healing us of things that need to be fixed in our lives. That it is a regular occurrence that we are growing in maturity and you're healing us of selfishness. You're healing us of anxiety. You're healing us of, of doubt. You're healing us of all kinds of things because that's our growth in you, part of our sanctification, part of the Holy Spirit's work in us to change us. Lord, it's something that we don't practice very well at all. Would you, or if we're wrestling with a deep spiritual need, if we are in a sinful situation, if we can't break free, and we know that it's hurting us, maybe it isn't hurting us physically yet, would you make us bold enough to go tell someone so we can get help? Would you kill our pride? Would you humble us and we'd be able to go and say, Keith, I don't want to tell you this. I don't want to ever tell, have to tell anybody this, but here it is. Blah. Lord, we need to start being more transparent with each other with our struggles. And Lord, we might be surprised at what physical ailments we have that are tied to our sin. We might be shocked at what you heal in our lives when we get rid of some of the sins. Because we may not know the things that we're suffering that are tied to the habits and the attitudes of our sin in our lives. So would you quicken us to deal with it one way or another? And lastly, Lord, would you make us quick to listen to whatever it is you're asking us to do? And Lord, if we're the recipient would you give us faith that if somebody came to us and said, I just want to pray for you, I know you've been hurting. God's led me to pray for you. I don't, I don't know what God's going to do in this, but I just, I just want to pray for you because that's what God's led me to do. Would you give us faith that you gave in that instruction for a reason? Would you give us faith that you planned in doing something special with that obedience? Would you give us faith that you do indeed wish to use each of us to heal each other. So that we would both be good at doing it when you ask us to do, but also receiving it when it's our turn to receive. That we would receive it humbly and with faith and with confidence of who you are and that you do work with people and through people in your church. But I pray that we would have a positive confidence about your capacity and willingness to heal, but that we would view each of these things in its proper biblical context, that we would accurately understand how you work, how you do what you do, and how your promises are. And that it is all for your glory every single time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.